Ritze. She will be giving us an overview on the proton therapy highlights of the INSPIRE project and advances in proton therapy. A quick introduction to Professor Kirkby. Um, she leads the research at the PPD and FLASH between the University of Manchester and the Christie. Her group numbers about 40 people. Uh, she, old, she also leads uh, ProtonInspire.eu. She has a research grant portfolio of over 28 million euros, uh, sorry, sterling, from a range of funders, charities, and industries. She has over 200 publications, including publications in Nature. Karen writes for Popular Science magazines as is, and is engaged also in outreach. Um, Professor Kirkby, it's a pleasure to have you here with us. Uh, thank you for accepting our invitation. I give you the floor. Thank you. Um, and it's a real pleasure to be with you this morning. Um, do I share my slides or? Um... You, you can share your slides. It's easier okay. for you to control them. It's probably easier. So I'll just get my, um, just give me a minute and I'll get my slides up. Can you there now you see one yes. or two slides? Yes, we can see it. You can see, can you see one or two? We're seeing one. Okay, brilliant, okay. So um, good morning everyone and thank you so much for this invitation to speak. Um, I'm going to talk to you about proton therapy and highlights of the INSPIRE projects um, and advances in proton therapy. So first of all, some disclaimers. I'm a member of the Varian Flash Forward Consortium and I have grants in a Varian Framework Agreement. So first of all, big thank you. Thank you for the invitation here, um, but also to colleagues in, in INSPIRE, whose work I'm going to present to you, our International Advisory Committee, Ethics Com Committee and User Selection Panel, who are brilliant, the EU for funding INSPIRE, our project officer and the reviewers. And I've also got some wonderful project managers who um, may basically make the project work so a huge thank you to them. In terms of collaborations um, we're part of the AERI network which um, brings together a number it's an infrastructure of infrastructures obviously we also um, are very happy to be working with Hitri Plus and the MPA project um, UHD Pulse. So what am I going to talk about? I'm going to tell you a bit about what Inspire is I'm then going to say a little bit about transnational access and networking activities. And this brings in the joint research activities and then look a bit towards the future. What I'm also going to show you as part of this talk is a little bit about what we've developed in Manchester, really to show you the sort of infrastructures that are available across Inspire, but I haven't shown you everybody's. Um, uh, I'm not sure whether I've got somebody with a microphone on because I'm getting some calls across. Um, I can hear. Manjit, can you switch off your mic, please? Um, so thank you. Um, so Inspire, it's got 17 partners. Obviously, being in Hitri Plus, you know about uh, networking, transnational access, and joint research activities. And it has 11 providers of transnational access. What it has is the PBT centres um, in different countries act as national hubs. So we haven't got all the proton centres in every country involved but we have got one in all the countries that had protons at the start of INSPIRE. Obviously, since then, there, there have been other countries that have developed proton therapy, um, but we have one center for each country that had proton therapy at the time of INSPIRE. We've also got the two major suppliers of proton therapy equipment, um, Varian and IBA involved. And you can find out more about INSPIRE on our website, which is protonsinspire.eu. Um, just a little bit about the way the project is, is put together. Um, I'm not going to read all of this out because people on this call know about um, um, infrastructure projects, but that's basically the way that INSPIRE is put together. So in terms of transnational access, it gives access to the research rooms in, P in proton therapy clinical centers. We don't, unlike Hitri Plus, we don't um, give access to the clinical beams um, or do um, treatments. That was something that was not included in the um, application, but we do, the research rooms give access to clinical beams um, and the research environment that surrounds them. 
Um, some of the centres have gantries, some have fixed beam lines for research, um, some have a scanning nozzle to scan the beam, some deliver a single spots um, and some of them became operational during Inspire so not all were available at the start of Inspire. Um, things have been a little bit disruptive as at mo in most of the world by COVID-19 and because of some changes in the partnerships that went on um, Marco Durante moved back to GSI um, during the grant so um, GSI became involved that way and also um, UMCG, um, the cyclotron that was at um, a facility called RUG is now part of UMCG. And so that can offer um, ions heavier than protons as well. And its applications for transnational access are through the website. So what, what are we capable of doing? Well, we can do radiobiology, we can do cells in 2D and 3D and tissue. Um, we have got one grant which is involving plants. We have a capability across the uh, across Inspire to also do some in vivo research, um, and that is you know bespoke and has to go via our ethics committee and local ethics as well. We've got experiments that have evolved for, uh, proton CT. We've had quite a lot of work on detector design and testing, and then we've undertaken some pan-European studies, which I'm going to mention here on radiobiology on metrology and on phantoms. And we do work on range verification, imaging, motion management. And as part of Inspire, we've also been developing some new technologies such as ultra high dose rate or flash and spatially fractionated radiotherapy. We've published um, a paper on the, um, particularly on the, um, what we can do in terms of radiobiology, and this appeared in Frontiers. So um, if you want to know more about the radiobiology facilities and what we can do, that's in this publication, which was published, I think, in 2020. I'm now going to show you a little bit about a facility, and I'm going to show you the facility in Manchester because it's the easiest one for me to talk about, and I, I've been very involved in the development. So what we did in Manchester when we, um, we our facility is in the Clinical Proton Therapy Centre, and it's in the fourth gantry room. There isn't a gantry because it's much cheaper and easier to be, build a fixed beam line. We didn't go for the variant solution, largely because Varian wanted to build a single fixed beam line and we wanted the capabilities to do um, to build additional beam lines and that's what I'm going to talk to you about. So we, we also had um, a requirement from NHS England that if they ever wanted to take the research room away and put in a gantry we had to design it so that they could do that which meant that we had to um, do the design of a floor that fitted in that gantry room. Um, all the uh, water, electricity, radiation protection, infrastructure, everything. Um, and if you have a look here, this is our, the design of our beam line A. So the beam comes from gantry three through this wall and down beam line A, we focus it. Um, and we're using very similar the magnets to those used on the clinical system. Um, and then we come down and here is a variant scanning nozzle. This is identical to those in the clinical room. So we can scan the beam over uh, 30 by 40 centimetres. And then the, the idea was to put um, end stations on the end that did different experiments. We've taken this idea from places like CERN and places that do the uh, large and the large synchrotron facilities so that we can do a range of experiments um, by putting an end station on the end. And this is our hypoxia end station, which I'll show you in a minute. And then we use um, a beam stop of water, a uh, big water phantom, which acts as a beam stop. So that is beam line A, and I'll show you a bit more about that in a minute. And then we're also designing a second beam line um, for in vivo research. This will have um, one centimetre, um, uh, sorry, one millimetre spots that can be scanned over an area by, of three, by three centimetres with the um, plan for a, a small animal irradiation platform so that we can actually image and irradiate um, animals and it's going to have some automation so that we can do up to um, 14 animals in a shift. But I'll show you a bit more about that um, in a minute. And these are some of the key people involved in um, developing this um, and we work very closely with the Cockcroft Institute to do this. So 
I've shown you a diagram. This is what it looks like. So the beam is coming out here, comes along here. This is the, uh, the scanning nozzle um, with the ionization chamber on the end. Um, this isn't our hypoxia cabinet. This is another, um, this is a movable stage coming onto the water tank. And again, these are some of the people, John, Nick, Sam and Sam, who've done a lot of the work commissioning this um, and the regular QA. We also have a small room. So this is our clinical facility, as you can see the psychotron here with three clinical gantries and then our research room here. Adjacent to that is a small area and is actually what in the clinical centre is a change, patient changing room, but it's two patient changing rooms knocked through, which is our bioprep room, in which we have crammed a very large amount of equipment. But um, this is a staging post, so we can bring samples in from our adjacent laboratories in um, just across the road and use this as a staging post so that we've got everything we might need, incubators, hypoxia, cabinet, there's a tissue culture hood over here. Um, and in one of our incubators, we've actually got an incusite. So we've tried to fit as much in as possible. Um, it's a little bit tight. Oh, we've also got an EVOS microscope so that we can do experiments in the research room, but then use the facilities in the Cancer Research UK major centre, which is just across the road. So I talked a little bit about end stations and what we wanted to be able to do, because we get beam time in the middle of the night, normally sometime between nine and 11, o'clock at night and through to four o'clock in the morning. We wanted to have the maximum throughput. So we talked to Don Whitley um, Scientific, who are just across the other side of the Pennines, about how big a hypoxia cabinet they could build for us, because we wanted to be able to do experiments at different oxygen tensions. And we also talked to Thermo and a company in Canada called Fanook, and we bought this robot and we integrated it into the hypoxia cabinet the um, proton beam comes through this window here, and we then built what we call a hotel, which will take different sample plates. We can take sample plates, um, we can take 96 well plates, um, T75 plus, we've got an adaptation for T25 plus, really it will take anything that we want um, and put it in these hotels and then the robot will pick them up, um, rotate them to the beam, which I think it's doing at the moment now, um, no, it's not. It's, it's going to pick something up now. Rotate it to the beam. We have a lot less liquid in the samples now, I should say. This was um, our first experiment. Um, irradiate them and then put them back. Um, on the top here, we've got a well wash versa so we can fix samples during the irradiation if we need to. We've done all the uh, dosimetry so that we know what the stray dosimetry is, um, which is very, which is tiny. The scattered dose is in the region of 1.27 millibray. And we can do experiments at both conventional and flash dose rates. And we've, we, can, um, we can deliver, we can do 56 samples in less than two hours. So it gives us that high throughput because one of the things we wanted to look at was reducing the uncertainties. And we can do this at different oxygen temperatures between four degrees C and 45 degrees C. So that was, it was a nice thing to do. And we worked very closely with the manufacturers because they'd never built one of these before. We also have um, a flash capability um, and um, we, we delivered our first flash beams in 2021. And I think if I set this video running, you can hear the first flash beam ever being delivered. Yeah. Yeah. Three, two, one, three, one. So there's our first flash beam. Um, and uh, slightly yeah. unsteady. Um, so that was our first flash beam being delivered. And we can scan that, um, as I said, um, over a very large area. Oh, I think if I can go on to the next. And this is an example. So if you look on the right, um, this is a loop video. We decided um, to, we've got a lot of control over our scanning. We don't often deliver a Manchester V, but this is the Manchester Worker V, which is the symbol of Manchester. And what is on this um, right-hand side of the slide is we're delivering um, a scanning pattern of a Manchester V with flash. On the left-hand side, this is with conventional dose rates. And it just shows, you know, everyone knows flash is much faster, but this is a demonstration of how much faster flash is and that we could, we've got precise control over the scanning of the beam 
And I'm not going to wait for this one to finish, but you can see where it's going. So that's a comparison between our convention and flash dose rates. We've done a lot of work looking at um, flash dosimetry because the normal ionization chambers um, do not work. Well, we get a, an undercounting of the flash dose rate. So we've done a lot of work, particularly work using diamond detectors to look at the uh, reproducibility reproducibility of our flash dose rates um, and also the measurement of them and we're actually using diamond detectors actually inserted into 96 volt plates and what I'm showing here is is some of um, our dosimetry again of measured dose versus target dose um, what you've got here is what happens if we don't correct the dose and, and with the corrections and using um, from monitor units into actual dose when we're running flash on different days, just so that we can keep an eye on it. And obviously at such high dose rates, we um, delivering some of the lower doses can be a bit of a challenge, but this is where we are actually delivering. And we're pretty happy with this. Um, we've talked to Varian about um, what's, the, um, what's the best in the world. And I think we're, our, our dosimetry is comparable to the best in the world with the clinical delivery we've set our standard at, at operating um, at the same um, precision as the clinical teams. And with Flash, it says on here, it's about 5%. Um, we now believe we've got it down to 3%. So we're pretty happy with that. And obviously if you're doing radiobiology, it's really important to make sure you've got the right dose. So as I said, we've, we've, we've designed Beamline A and we've now, I've shown you some, some of what we've done on that. Um, we're now looking to design the second Beamline, Beamline B. Um, obviously this is, this will operate, um, we're going to um, degrade the beam so we, we get it to lower energies. And we're also going to develop a small animal scanning nozzle so that um, we don't just deliver a single spot, we can actually scan this beam over three by three centimeters. And what we want to do is have a spot size that is, is comparable um, to that in humans, but in animals, so that, you know, for example, um, the normal spot size with proton beams has a, um, a sigma of about six millimeters. We're reducing this right down to one millimeter or smaller and adding this um, imaging capability using an extra SAR. Um, this is a simulation of um, our of the beamline. That's the beamline A that I've shown you, and this is one of our design simulations for beamline B. And we've put in this a um, a CAD of our um, our zoomorphic phantom. So we're we're using this to investigate the beam optics, um, which we're in the process of undergoing procurement now. And this is what's going on the end of it. So we're we're planning to add um, we're planning to work with for Nuke, so we add a, um, a robotic arm so that we can actually have, a, this time our hotel will have anesthetize animals in it and we can pick up the animal and irradiate it um, and image it, well, image it and then irradiate it. Um, we've been talking to some of our um, colleagues about how many animals they would need for, for session. And we've obviously got to include all the, um, everything to make sure that the animals are um, happy while they're being irradiated and um, working with the vets on that. So that's um, hopefully if I talk to you again, we'll have that in place. Um, and this is a bit more on that. So we're in the, at the moment, we're in the formal procurement process for that. Um, and then we've got to modify the research room so it's suitable for animals and then install it. Um, what I should say is one of the things we're working on is we're not just a lot of the flash work that's done at the moment with protons is done in transmission, um, which loses one of the key bits of the protons, which is the Bragg peak. Um, and so we're planning to be able to do um, in both our in vitro and in vivo line um, Bragg peak flash as well as transmission flash by using a ridge filter. Um, and I'll show you a little bit of that a bit later on. So that's the sort of capabilities that um, our partners in Inspire have available um, to them. Um, one of the things that we've done 
through INSPIRE is to expand our capabilities through our joint research activities. I've shown you the hypoxia ca um, cabinet that we've developed in Manchester. Um, our colleagues at GSI are developing um, a compact hypoxia chamber that is portable, which they have, um, they're in the process of patenting, which is a different way of doing some of the hypoxia measurements, but obviously extremely valuable. So, you know, I think this is something that will have come out of um, Inspire. Another part of Inspire has been about building a flash capability. So at the start of Inspire, um, there was people were getting interested in flash. Um, and I have just realized I haven't actually told you why we're interested in flash. So I'll, I'll just um, stop and just say that for the moment. So um, ultra high dose rate uh, flash radiotherapy is there are reports that it spares um, normal tissue while still suppressing tumor growth. Now, if you could, if this actually fulfills its potential, then it could be transformative for the future of radiotherapy. Um, and so having centers that can deliver uh, proton beams, which have a flash capability is obviously um, a very useful thing to be able to explore whether flash actually does what it says, what people are claiming for it. And so that's one of the reasons why Inspire has developed this capability. We've also developed um, some zoomorphic phantom. So these are 3D, um, printed mice, they're, they're basically taken, you take a CT scan of a mouse and then you um, use tissue equivalent material so that you can develop this dosimetry standard. We've used this on an audit, on a national audit with x-rays um, using alanine pellets and film. And the plan is for this to now go um, international and be used with both protons and proton flash and maybe even heavier ions. Our colleagues in Namur have developed um, an animal radiation platform that can fit on gantries, both the IBA and varying gantries, and we're about to test that out, um, not with um, real mice, but um, with um, our plastic mice to check that that will actually work on the gantry. We've developed a whole range of software and databases, and there's also a patent on drug delivery nano peanuts that's coming out of Krakow. So again, there's been quite a lot that's come through the transnational access and um, the joint research activities. In terms of networking, and again, combining with um, both networking and joint research activities, we've had joint collaborative projects across Inspire on benchmarking. Um, there's one on radio biology, which I'll show you in a minute, that's led by Olga at GSI. There's one on dosimetry that's led by Marie Dabikova um, in Prague. And there's one on RBE and LET, which is led by Armin Lohr from Dresden. He was at Dresden at the time, he's now at Dortmund, but um, I'll show you that again. We've had activities on public engagement and outreach. Again, I'll show you a bit on that. And our work package five was an innovation gateway in working with industry. And again, I'll show you a couple of examples that come from that. So this is our radiobiology um, experiment. Um, and what GSI did was they created a phantom with plates that ran along the, um, so we could look at different points along the Bragg Peak and look at the radiobiology um, using um, clonogenic survival. The first bit of this study was to um, basically do a simulation of a spread out Bragg Peak. Um, and then it was to do the experiments along that. There were two different geometries and our colleagues at Groningen had a, a because their energy only went up to 30 MeV, they used a, a slightly different one. But we had nine institutes taking part. Um, and like I say, this was the phantom being used. And part of this was to start to look at this, um, if you go to the Paganetti paper and you look at RBE versus LET, you can see that there's a large spread on the, um, on some of the spots. And it was to start to reduce some of the radiobiology, biological uncertainty that we see across the world. And to understand that as well. So this was the experiments that we did. Um, these 
um, this was on our research beam line, and this was the Phantom. Um, we did we did some work with film first of all um, before we put the um, the um, plates with the cells in. And these are the results now. You can see here the the blue line is what we should be getting and you can see we've actually got quite a lot of spread. One of the things that we learned by doing this experiment was actually understanding positions within a spread out brag peak because you can imagine, particularly at this distal edge, a small, a small error in placement of the plate could give you a very large error in um, the um, in survival. Um, and so some of these experiments are being repeated because we actually found that everyone didn't have their plates or their, their phantom in exactly the same position. And as, as I say, a slight shift can cause quite a big difference. I know the first time we ran it, we actually found that we weren't getting this, um, this blip at the end. And that was largely because um, we, there was a slight error in our beam model. Um, we hadn't put, um, when you looked at the information that came from PTW who make the water phantom, there was some ambiguities as to um, the positioning. So we went back and redid that. So again, this is, a, this is an ongoing um, study, but it's been a learning study. And we've, the other thing that we found was that um, the phantom, because you're putting cells directly um, into it, um, we found that GSI always used an antibiotic, whereas we didn't. Um, and once we used that, we we had less cell death. Um, and there was a lot of there was a big learning experience, and actually, it's been a very um, useful experiment to do. It's in the process of being finished, and I think there's a few more results come through now. The next study we did was to look at how RBE relative biological effectiveness, but um, varies with LET and to compare and harmonize the way we did our LET calculations. It involved nine um, Inspire partners and different centers use different treatment planning systems and their own center beam model. Um, and this was all about um, understanding because at the moment clinically we use a constant RBE of 1.1 for treatment. And it was to look at what the opportunities were and the potential was of using a variable RBE in a, first of all, in a water phantom, and then to look at some set patient cases where we all looked at the same patient. So just to give you a bit of um, background, in clinical practice, um, we use an RBE of 1.1. Um, and the research findings are that um, we know that at the distal end in particular, the RBE increases, um, and that is what is seen in vitro and whether that is applicable to use um, in the clinic. So what we did was we looked at um, what was done at each centre, the way we calculated LET, because there's a number of different ways of calculated, and the way we, way we did our variable RBE mod model modeling and to look at whether we we could all harmonize on that in terms of the patient treatment and then look at the clinical outcome data and the aims were towards a looking for a a, um, a model that we could use with a variable rbe in clinical proton therapy it was about harmonizing the way we defined let and the way we calculated let across europe and then to look at how we how that worked clinically on um, different clinical cases. We also this is this is some cases where we use different models. So the first one is the McNamara model um, from um, um, Amy McNamara at um, MGH. Then we use the Wedenberg model, um, and then the uh, model developed by Steve McMahon in Belfast. Um, and compared and contrasted those um, with the, for, for the same case where the prescription dose was 57 gray, and you can see the CTV marked in, um, and there was a CTV boost and 33 fractions, and just looked at those clinical treatments um, and how we could um, biologically optimize them. 
The next project involved seven Inspires partners. So the next one was on dosimetry. It was designed as an audit for um, a dosimetry audit for gantries, but it was adapted also to work with um, fixed beams. And this was positioning different um, dosimeters within a water phantom. These were thermoluminescent capsules, alanine pellets, and radio photoluminescent detectors. And this study is still ongoing. Uh, Maria Davikova read, led this study, and I haven't actually got the results from it yet, but it compared nine different, um, seven Inspire partners and um, some partners from Eurodos. Um, so I think it's a bit watch this space for that one. Through Inspire, we actually um, have our news and newsletters on the website, and we have a six monthly newsletter, which gives an indication of what's going on. So that's, um, that's an example of that. Um, we've also been doing, um, we do public engagement and outreach, and this is some work that my colleagues in Krakow did. They've run an open nights program um, and they ran it all the way through COVID. Um, and this video, which I'm not going to run, is actually in Polish. Um, and I actually, I think I might see what comes up there. I don't know if that's, uh, I'll go back. Um, I think that was just a... So um, during COVID, they attracted over a thousand um, participants to um, their, their open night where they they actually explain um, what what proton therapy is they explain some of the research that they're doing they show people how the gantries operate um, and they answer questions and I think it's been quite successful um, in fact very successful um, and like I said I think they go they're hoping to go back to in-person meetings but the online ones have been uh, very effective so um, going on to more work that we've been doing, um, we've, been, we've developed um, with the Science Museum in London and Cancer Research UK and Inspire, we've developed um, a big exhibition, um, but our work on proton therapy has been highlighted in that um, exhibition. Um, I don't think this video is working um, and there probably isn't time to do it. Um, no, I think I, I don't think the um, the video is actually embedded and I'd hope to show it to you, but uh, I don't think I've enabled it. But you can see as part of the, the exhibition, we've got um, we've got our video that shows proton therapy in operation and some of the work in the research room. We've also um, developed a knowledge hub and fact sheets. Um, in the UK, we've done these um, these fact sheets with um, a company with a charity called the Brains Trust, um, which are for patients and answer um, a number of questions. Um, it's, it's about when we should use proton therapy, why it's not used for everyone, um, what to expect, how it works. Um, there's a bit of myth busting because some patients think that proton therapy is magical and if they're not getting proton therapy, they're not getting the best treatment and it's all about making sure that that, that is understood. Um, different countries do things in different ways. So this is some of the information in, in Germany. This is some of what's going on in Sweden and in France, just for example. And these are in the um, languages of those countries. I now wanted to talk about something a little bit different, and this is our um, this is our innovation gateway, and this is a project that we um, that Varian put into our work package ten, which was about developing their ionization chamber on the end of the nozzle, so that it was compatible with flash dose rates. Now this started off as ba basically um, tech um, technology readiness levels one or two. Um, the initial idea actually worked and we were able to rapidly take these developments um, into developing a prototype. So Varian developed a prototype, a new um, ionization chamber based on these results um, that they, um, they basically made capable of research. They tested it um, in, initially in Cincinnati 
and they've then used it in the world's first proton flash clinical trial. Now, this is, this is the FASTO-1 trial. It's just completed in Cincinnati, and the results are about to be um, discussed at ESTRO. This was for painful bone metastases in extremities, so in the limbs, where they only recruited 10 patients, but, um, but they delivered flash dose rates to relieve the pain. There's a second um, clinical trial about to open again in Cincinnati called FAST-02, which is now on painful bone metastases, but now in the thorax, particularly in, um, with um, metastases in, on things like ribs. Um, so they've, um, Verin have developed um, a commercial research project called FLEX, which is available um, as a ionization chamber for, um, for research rooms. Um, and they're developing a clinical prototype, um, which is being tested in Aarhus at the moment. This clinical prototype allows them to move between um, flash and conventional dose rates. The flex product is only for um, um, flash dose rates, but obviously if you're going to use this clinically, you need to be able to move between clinical, um, between flash um, and non and conventional dose rates. There's also um, a development going on um, with um, PTW and um, GSI are also involved in this through the UHD Pulse project to be able to deliver Bragg Peak Flash. Um, and this is using 3D range modulators so that um, in the future we'll be able to work on conformal um, flash, which, which involves um, basically using the Bragg Peak. We've also done a, another project with um, a, company, a small company called Avacam, who came to us again through UHD Pulse, and this was carried out at Dresden. Um, and they've done work at both conventional and uh, flash dose rates. And again, this, this, um, this has enabled them to, this is another type of um, measurement um, of flash dose rates. Changing the subject slightly, um, we've been working with our colleagues at, in um, the Netherlands and the Netherlands basically select patients. They have a fixed indication list, but they also use um, a model-based selection where they, what they actually do is they plan a patient with photons and they plan a patient with photons sorry, with protons, and they look at what they call the delta NTCP, so the normal tissue complication probability. And using that delta NTCP, they are able to um, work out is, should there be, is there a benefit? So is that patient likely to have a benefit of, of um, having protons? And if they do, they will go on and have protons. And if they don't, they will be treated with photons. And this is this model-based selection um, criteria has been is very much being used in other countries around the world now. One of the problems with it was that it was developed basically for head and neck cancers and works extremely well and has been validated for those. But there wasn't a lot of NTCP models for other parts of the um, anatomy. So how would, you, how would you use this model-based selection on other parts of the body? And one of the things that we've been doing within Inspire is to develop an NTCP database um, with um, particularly through Groningen and IBA. And this has allowed us to develop those other NTCP models and to put them into a common database so that the model-based selection um, can be applied to other tumor sites. During INSPIRE, we also held the uh, PTCOG, which is the big um, proton and particle therapy conference, which just happened. I've just come back from a meeting um, which was the first in-person meeting since we held the one in Manchester. This was June 2019, where we attracted 1,350 delegates um, to Manchester um, and um, to PTCOG. Um, you'll see here, this is Jürgen de Boost that many of you will know from Heidelberg, who, who gave the um, R. Wilson lecture. 
So that was one of the things that happened. We're also, um, we're developing a new conference series because we looked at what was around, which is called Flash Radiotherapy and Particle Therapy. Our first meeting was held online um, um, last year. We had hoped to hold it in Vienna, but then Omicron hit and um, everything stopped. So we went online. We attracted over 70 part 700 participants from over 40 countries. The next meeting is between the 29th of November and the 2nd of December. We're hoping for in person in Barcelona. Um, there'll be another special edition of the Green Journal, which will hold the best papers. We're going to have a special session for History Plus as part of that meeting, so I hope you'll all be coming along to that. Um, we'll hold it in person and virtual. Um, and it will cover things like building and operating both a proton centre and a heavier um, ion centre. It'll cover flash, spatially fractionated radiotherapy, um, and a session on protons and ions, and as I say, a special session for HITRI+. We're looking at modalities, mechanisms, and how to take into the clinic. There's three webinars coming up. The first one on Proton Flash was on the 10th of June, but is still available online. And we're very proud that this is going to be a green conference. So you can, if you attend the conference, you can offset your carbon um, emissions. It's a, a no plastics conference, and we're doing everything we can to ensure that the conference is as green as possible and have the green um, certification with that. So that's a little bit to show you um, FRPT. Wow. So what's in the future? I have two minutes left. Uh, okay, thank Professor. you. Yeah, I've, I'm almost there. Um, what's in the future? I think collaboration is absolutely key. So um, HITRI Plus um, is, it, you know, we very much want to work with HITRI Plus and there's a new grant which involves Inspire that's just about to start called Cancer. Um, increase the TNA capacity, move close to the clinic. I've shown how we work with industry. And then there's looking at personalizing treatment in terms of outcomes and collecting clinical outcomes through EPROMs, et cetera, real-time monitoring through wearables, involving patients mm -hmm. decision-making, um, looking at digital biomarkers and also um, things like circulating tumor cells, circulating DNA and integrating with imaging. I think there's the next generation of clinical trials which look at um, and for things like ped pediatric and rare tumors, we need a pan-European approach. And in terms of health benefits, um, who benefits most from protons and how will they be chosen? Look at health in inequalities across Europe and also the impact of COVID. I've got to say a huge thank you to my colleagues in Inspire and also the colleagues in my group who, um, who contributed a lot of the slides. That is a nice Hitri Plus slide, and thank you for Thank you so much, Professor, for that uh, really interesting talk on uh, Inspire and the status of proton therapy, which focus on um, what's going on at uh, Manchester. Uh, indeed, very interesting. Thank you so much for the overview. So um, I hand over to Joe, who's going to manage the questions. Thank you, Nicholas, and thank you again, Karen. That was a, a really interesting talk on all the activities and the things being done in the Inspire project. So if we first of all take the first question from Kwangdon. Yeah, thank you very much for the nice talk, and it was really interesting because I'm currently researching about NTC as well. So but if possible, I would like to ask some discussion after the question section. Is it possible, Professor Korpke? Uh, she, she's not listening, maybe. Okay, I'll talk later. So my question is that when I review a lot of NTCP papers for same modality and the same organ at risk, then I see that the models are not really reproducible. So they are having a lot of different parameters for lehman kutcher berman models. So my question is that when we're reading NTCP, will it be a reliable model or it is just, uh, just like uh, we need more study to understand NTCP and go for the usage? 
Um, I think that's a that's a really good question, and I think um, some of the NTCP models are more refined than others, and. I think it's it's one of those things that you can look at the NTCP models and you can always improve them. And, and I think, for example, the head and neck models have quite a lot of work has been done by the group in Groningen to validate them against clinical studies. Um, they basically look, at, look been looking at the, um, the toxicities, um, grade three and four toxicities and how what the model um, predicts matches what is seen clinically. Now they've also done some studies um, in the US as well as in um, Groningen, um, both retrospective and prospective. And I think the, the models are pretty good for head and neck. How that works in other organs, I, I totally agree. A lot more work needs to be done there. And I think a lot more work also needs to be done um, making sure that we've got the proton outcomes to match to inform those models. And some of the models are actually, um, uh, they're not as sophisticated as they probably could be. Now, I'm not sure whether I properly answered your question there, but you know, there's, a, there's an awful lot of work still to be done. Yeah. Um, so. What I have to say is the UK doesn't use the model-based selection criteria. Um, and part, um, we are we have a clinical trial ongoing at the moment called Torpedo, and one of the um, parts of that trial is actually to to run um, the Delta NTCP models that the Dutch are using, and to see whether if we'd use them, whether that patient would have got protons, because our our study is a randomised trial, not. Um, a, an NTCP based trial. So I think it will be interesting to look at, um, you know, whether the results we get out uh, validate the Dutch model or not. Um, what I should say is it's probably, you know, it is one of the ways of doing it. There are also lots of questions about, you know, if you're looking at serial and parallel organs, um, um, would you plan in the same way? Um, you know, do you put in a particularly, you know, how do you, um, if you, how do you compare between a proton plan and a photon plan? And do you always, you know, um, is your way of getting the Delta NCCP um, the right one? I think the Dutch have largely got that, that sorted. That was one of the early criticisms um, for that model. But I think it, it works pretty well in head and neck cancers. I think for other tumour sites, it's still a work in progress. But part of the work we did in Inspire was to really pull all the user database of NTCP models so that we've got something to use. It, as I say, it's a work in progress. Thank you. Uh, I have a lot of questions more, but I think <laughs> we have more questions here. So may I, may I ask you a discussion later in Slack or some personal uh, contact? Yeah, um, I think my email's on the slide. So very, very much, please send me a slide, Very uh, an email. I'm very happy to discuss with you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And now on to uh, Philippa for the next question. Hi, hello. Thank you for your talk. Um, I wanted to ask regarding the slide that you mentioned. I cannot recall the name of the study, but it was uh, when you are like the different um, centers of Inspire are using the same model for LET computer, are, are computing LET in the same way, but then the RBE is done differently, uh, the, the RBE modeling. So I wanted to ask, uh, because for me it was not clear, so then the goal is to compare which, which RBE model works best. So this is part of my question. And then the other part of the question, and also if it would make sense to have like uh, a different RBE modeling for proteins depending on the tissue itself, and then my second part of the question is, if, uh, in your opinion, of course, how far do you think we are from actually changing the the, the standard of 1.1 value uh, in the clinics? Yeah. So if I, I'll, I'll start at the end, um, probably at the end question and then work backwards. Um, so the, the end question, I think at the moment, we're pretty much staying on um, an RBE of 1.1 with protons. Um, I think there is a concern about um, if we, if well, first of all, the RBE, um, that increase in RBE at the distal end of the Bragg peak is seen 
with in vitro results, but I think there's quite a lot of work going on as to whether we actually see that um, in vivo. Um, so it, there would be a danger if you use that variable RBE that um, you know you might um, you might not get the dosimetry to the tumor. You know you might um, overdose the tumor, or you might cause damage, particularly at the distal end and close to organs at risk. So I think there is there's a bit of a concern about that, and I think at the moment um, because. I think every centre bar one in the world uses, and that centre uses an RBE of one. Um, I think getting people to move to variable RBE is probably not going to happen until we start to see some results. And um, some some of the some of the other questions, you know, um, there are there are some results around the world where um, we're seeing um, we do see an effect even with an RBE of 1.1 in patients, we do see um, some um, necrosis, some bone necrosis. Um, it's not known um, whether that is um, a cause of the distal end of the, um, of the proton beam and whether, you know, whether we are getting a higher RBE at the end of the beam. Um, but there's studies going on to try and work out what is going on in that area. There seems to be a particular, um, there's been some studies in Heidelberg where um, if you overlap, um, for example, with the subventricular region of the brain, they're starting to pick something up, but that's when you're using 1.1. So if we, if we then took into account a higher, um, a higher RBE, you know, that might be an argument that we should use it. But I think that's been seen in some centers, but not in others, like places like MGH and PSI that have been treating for a very long time. The last time I talked to them, they haven't picked up that evidence, whereas in Dresden, they seem to have. So I think the jury is a bit out on some of the evidence that might say we need to take it into account. Working back through your questions, I apologize. Um, the different centers weren't using different models. We, we, uh, effectively, we all use the same models, but we um, but we used it with different treatment planning systems. I took out one of the slides which explained that, and I probably should have left it in. So we were all using the same models. We were all using the same calculation of LET, but what was different was different centers have different beam model ways the beam is coming in, um, and, and some centers. So at the moment, we're using our treatment planning system. We also used, most centers also have a Monte Carlo verification technique and we've used our different Monte Carlo verification techniques some of which use gate um, I think there's the uh, frog technique that's been developed um, a G on GPU so we used our our home way of doing our Monte Carlo verification and then we compared and contrasted the results there's a paper that came out that is um, where I think Armin is the first author and if you want um, a reference to that paper, I can I can send it to you. But that details the whole study, and I hope will make it clearer than I clearly did on the talk. Um, Thank so you. I, I, I have I answered your question now. Yes. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. And another question from uh, Rita. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Yes. Hi. Very good talk. Thank you. I just wanted to ask if you're considering doing any research in treatment uh, verification or monitoring in vivo because especially with flash if you are delivering such a high dose uh, how do you acquaint for this case of not having a monitoring i don't know if you understand my question so is your question that how are we going to monitor the dose exactly. the yeah but if you do yeah. it in vivo or if you are only considering doing the, the previously dosimetry to have an idea or um, so, so um, what we do before we do any flash experiments, and we would do exactly the same in vivo, would be to um, set up the beam and use, um, at the moment we're using uh, diamond detectors, so we would normally have those in front of the beam. Um, one of the things that we've been doing is we've been developing um, zoomorphic phantoms, so the first bit that we would do is with a straight diamond detector, we would then um, probably move on to um, a, um, one of the phantoms with um, 
a with both diamond detectors, you know, the film we can only look at afterwards, but we've been using film quite a lot um, in our in vitro measurements, just so that we've got a record, just in case anything goes wrong between the um, the setup and actually doing the measurements. So we would we would do, you know, with in vivo work, we will be governed very closely um, by the um, the vets and the regulators. So we would have to get the uh, dosimetry correct. So. We're also developing um, on the system in Manchester, we will have um, an ionization chamber, which will be designed similarly to the way the um, variant flashing MSIC is designed so that we can actually have a, um, a measurement there. We're also talking to people, um, companies such as um, Pyramid, who make, um, who are designing um, detectors for, for flash. So, your question is very well founded. You know, we would not undertake any animal measurements um, or irradiation unless we'd done very, very careful um, in vivo dosimetry beforehand, um, because you know we wouldn't. Well, it's not ethical to to just irradiate animals if you don't know what dose you're delivering. And one of the things that we've been working very hard um, to do is to make sure that our doses are what they should be. Um, the preclinical phantoms were developed because there were studies that talked about um, dosimetry with x-rays varying plus or minus 40% around the world. And so those um, preclinical phantoms were developed so that we could do uh, dosimetry at conventional dose rates with x-rays and protons. Um, obviously with flash, that um, doing um, any measurements is much more tricky because it's delivered at such a short dose rate. That's why the project UHD Pulse was conceived. And um, there are, um, the um, successor to UHD Pulse is likely to look at um, protons and heavier ions in more detail. So yes, you know, we've got to make sure we've got the metrology straight. There's a number of different ways of doing it. Um, and that's something we'll be actively doing. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay, so um, time is now um, uh, to move on. Uh, Professor Kirkby, that was very interesting indeed. And I thank you once again for this lecture. So we will now move on um, to our coffee break. We will